Warm welcome to everyone. Good morning, everyone. My name is Rusan Stefanov, and I'm the director of the economic program of the Center for the Study of Democracy. And um, I'd like to welcome you to this uh, uh, webinar on translating the European Green Deal uh, to long, into long-term decarbonization approaches, where we hope, together with uh, stakeholders from all over Europe, uh, to discuss what are the best practices, what are the possible approaches that Bulgaria, among the countries in Southeast Europe, or in Central and Eastern Europe, could take to make the Green Deal work for the uh, work for the country. I'm very happy that today we are joined by an outstanding panel of uh, uh, European uh, experts, including uh, our keynote speaker, uh, uh, Professor Wei, from Technical University in, in, in Berlin. Uh, thank you also to our government representatives. These are very testing times for all of us, but uh, it's always a pleasure to have uh, 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 Deputy Minister Zecho Stankov, who seems to be the paramount key person in, in the um, all the discussions about climate uh, and energy transition. Uh, I've talked, I've spoken with different ministries and they all say you should talk to Zecho, you know, if you want anything being done here. So thank you very much for really taking time in your busy agenda. We really appreciate that. And we always, always appreciate that we could work together uh, uh, with you. Also, thanks to Boriana Kamenova, who has been uh, with us on our different uh, um, uh, discussions. Um, and uh, my biggest thank is actually to, to our partners from the Friedrich Heberstiftung in Sofia, to Helena Kortlander. Um, CSD has been working with Friedrich Heber Stiftung more than 10 years ago, actually, when we started on the uh, green, uh, uh, green energy security in Bulgaria on air quality. Uh, and these have been really great times. And I really would like to thank the Friedrich Heber uh, Foundation for uh, being supporting for all, all this time, for providing really good ideas, for uh, being a great partner uh, into bringing in also European um, uh, ideas and, uh, and best practice. Um, with that, I would like to um, uh, focus just very briefly on uh, what we think is, is important. And I think in, in the case of, uh, of, of Bulgaria, uh, and of course countries in Southeast Europe and in Central and Eastern Europe, it is critical that we use the next year uh, to jumpstart this uh, green transition and to make use of all the tools that actually uh, we've been made available through the, uh, uh, through the EU and through our partners in, uh, in Europe. I think this is a critical uh, moment in time and I hope that we could build strong public-private partnerships uh, and get the most uh, out of the experience of our European partners because clear clearly both the public and the private sector in Bulgaria uh, uh, still lack a lot of capacity, a lot of knowledge in terms of building uh, this um, uh, uh, Green Deal benefits for Bulgaria. At the same time, there are many, many good examples and we've, we've already done quite a lot of good things. Um, let me just say that I would, we would like to hear and we will be hearing from my colleague Martin. Uh, we are trying to, Vodimirov, we will be trying to build uh, different uh, models, different uh, tools to help uh, Bulgaria, Bulgarian authorities, Bulgarian businesses, Bulga uh, Bulgarian trade unions and uh, employers associations to make this transition uh, happen. And I would like to say that it's extremely important that we all we all on the same page, that we start focusing on what really matters to Europe and what we actually agree with our partners in the European Union. In that respect, um, you know this position CSD has held for many, many years. I think the continuing destruction with large-scale projects, uh, in particular in the nuclear, has been uh, quite, um, how, how to say, uh, distracting, as I said, uh, from this paramount priority of uh, uh, green development. And I should say that this actually um, does not allow the country to make the most or the, to take all the benefits from the Green Deal and from the opportunities, but also to engage the private sector, because I think a critical element of successfully using the additional funds that have been provided or will be provided from European taxpayers, and including Bulgarian taxpayers, um, to um, uh, the Bulgarian government makes it a huge responsibility to actually attract uh, much more private investment because uh, igniting or leveraging this private capital is really critical for Bulgaria to uh, make this transition. 
With that, I would like to thank you all very much for attending today, and I would like to pass uh, the floor to our partner, uh, Helena Kortlander, uh, for her opening statement. Helena. Thank you, Ruslan. Uh, welcome also in the name of the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung. Thanks to everybody for joining this morning. It just may be a healthy break from continuously pushing the refresh button for new results from the US elections. Uh, but if you push it any way during the session, it's still on topic, I guess. That, as Ruslan said before, that uh, the results there will probably uh, reflect also on the politics of the Green Deal in future. Uh, when we started planning this event in the beginning of 2020, uh, the European Green Deal was at the very top of the European agenda and it was certainly the talk of the town. Um, and since then it has moved down a little on the agenda, um, and, uh, but seems to resurface more and more as we are starting to realize that uh, we cannot wait for the COVID crisis to end, but things have to happen simultaneously now. Um, this, I think, is also reflected in, in the ongoing debate about the EU's multi-annual annual financial framework, um, like the challenge of finding a way out of the Corona health cri crisis and uh, the connected economical crisis um, in the EU, as well as promoting the goals of the Green Deal, pose quite a challenge uh, now on the uh, level of negotiation and probably even more so when they have to be put into practice. And um, as we know that uh, for Southeast Europe, the challenge may be even a bit bigger as the starting conditions are more adverse than they are in other countries, um, as the states of the region do rely on coal heavily so far. Um, in addition, in many of the Southeast European countries, energy prices are a highly political issue, more so than in other countries and uh, which seems to make governments very hesitant to touch upon the issue, uh, especially when facing popular unrest uh, and discontent anyways, as was the case in Bulgaria this year and uh, other countries of the region as well. Um, in our work as Friedrich Ebert Stiftung on the issue of phasing out of coal in Bulgaria, we actually saw quite a drawback of some actors in the course of this year. Um, for instance, with the trade unions from from a position that seemed to slightly open towards the thought of ending coal mining in Bulgaria to now a position of putting it off as long as possible. And uh, I think this change of mind uh, also shows that there is more political leadership needed and um, that the energy transition has to appear as a political goal of the state and that it is going to happen and not to be avoided. Um, looking at the region, uh, the European integration of the Western Balkans countries uh, is one and has been one of Bulgaria's primarily uh, foreign policy goals. And uh, I think most Bulgarian governments have advocated for improved economic cooperation in Southeast Europe. So the en energy sector is one of the main fields for that and uh, it does not always have to be nuclear and fossil energy. Um, I suppose that if countries cooperate, the region as a whole has many opportunities for, for phasing in renewable energies and uh, for benefiting from engagement in supply chains uh, for uh, the renewable sector. But I guess we will hear more on that from the experts later. Mm, and uh, it will be interesting for me at least to see how important a role this issue will play on the Berlin summit agenda next week and, and how far the Green Deal will be part of that agenda. Um, as a social democratic organization, the FBS is paying special attention always to the interconnection between the social issues and uh, the ecological concerns. And FBS globally advocates for a wide reaching socio-ecological transformation um, that will enable higher quality of life for all while respecting the limitations of our planet's resources. Um, and I hope that uh, today's session can be part of that endeavor. Uh, I would like to thank Uruslan and Radostina and the CSD for putting together this panel. Um, and uh, I am very interesting and interested myself in the inputs. And uh, with that, uh, I would hand over to you, Radostina. 
Thanks, Helene. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Radustina Primova, and I work at the Center for the Study of Democracy and also focus very much on this uh, quite challenging pro uh, process of the green transition in Bulgaria, but also I have worked extensively on international climate policy and the green economy uh, in the past. It's a great pleasure and honor to moderate uh, the event today, and I would like to welcome virtually all our online participants uh, to the webinar today called Translating the European Green Deal into Long-Term Decarbonization Alternatives. I would like to take the occasion to thank uh, very much also um, the Friedrich Hebert Foundation for their, for their fruitful collaboration uh, to this event. Uh, we are hosting this event in very challenging times. There are no simple solutions for the multiple crises we are facing. Uh, facing, however, the management of the crisis also provides uh, also opportunities. And I think the Green Deal is a kind of a historic opportunity we shouldn't miss. The European Green Deal uh, and combined with the current um, uh, package for, of, of green stimulus, the, the current recovery package of the EU, could also provide a very important push towards uh, decarbonization and especially in the Southeast European region. And the benefits are manifold. That being said, I'm um, very much delighted to be joined uh, by our interesting guests today and also that we managed to put together a European format of this event uh, by inviting uh, also uh, experts from different countries of Europe and also representatives also from uh, the Bulgarian ministries on energy and environment. Uh, without taking further the, um, uh, well, without uh, stealing away the discussion, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Pau Yuoa, uh, who is um, who is a professor and head of the Coal Exit, as you can see from uh, from his logo. Uh, he's the head of the Coal Exit Research Group at the Technical Universities of Berlin and some of the one of the most well-known experts in Germany on the coal phase out. He has been involved in numerous projects, Horizon 2020 projects on German and global coal phase out. So he has a global perspective on uh, the topic of coal phase out and just transition. He has also worked for the German Advisory Council on the environment. And he's going to present to us uh, some uh, results uh, on uh, economic uh, modeling uh, for decarbonization, some more ambitious uh, scenarios for reaching the carbon neutrality target, as you know. Then he's going to share with us also some lessons learned from the German Coal Commission that was already set up to work on the long-term planning of the coal phase out in Germany. So Mr. Paul UOA, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction. So I will try to share my screen with you so that um, you can see my slides. And I hope that this works now and you can see my slides. Um, so thank you very much for the introduction. So I'm working for the Technical University Berlin as well as for the DIW Berlin, which is the German Institute for Economic Research. And I'll be presenting a couple of works, not only of me, but also of my colleagues on various items. And as mentioned, I will start with some more quantitative um, modeling results, um, examining different pathways for the EU Green Deal, including carbon neutrality for Europe. And we have a model that has a lot of functionalities which are not that important. Um, important to note is maybe that we are examining not only the electricity sector, but the building sector, the industry and the transportation. So a lot of different sectors which all have different challenges. Um, and we examine all regions in Europe, including of course also Bulgaria, and we look until 2050. We, don't, we know that the world doesn't end in 2051, but this is as is the target carbon neutrality by 2050, this was our first focus. And then the aspects to understand when you try to do modeling is that, of course, you cannot predict the future. Um, I cannot tell you 100% what will happen, but we try to analyze what are different possibilities that we could imagine. And therefore, we started off with thinking in different scenarios and there are different things we can imagine in a society to happen. We could imagine in general a more smart society, people, climate awareness, activism, people change their behavior, they adapt, they use less energy. This is a possibility. There's a possibility of technology novelty. This is something like the 
technology becomes cheaper, we get to find out new um, technological appliances. So basically new technologies will make it easier or cheaper to reach climate targets. And there's a different angle which we could exert policy exertions. So there are strong political measures. This could be, be a stronger CO2 price. This could be um, technical regulations um, forbidding to use certain technologies. So there's a lot of different things that we could imagine that could drive more climate policies within Europe and that could lead to us reaching 1.5 or 2 degrees centigrade as a target. So therefore, we thought of these different things that could happen and we don't know exactly which of the things will happen. So we tried to imagine four different scenarios that we could come up with because I, want, I do not want to show you this is the future, but we examine different things, different angles. So for example, there's a techno-friendly scenario. So these are these colorful buttons here. Techno-friendly means the society adapts as well as we have a bit more technology. A directed transition is basically technology breakthroughs in combination with additional policy measures. And then we have a societal commitment where the society adapts and there's certain climate policies, but there's less technological novelty. And then there's something in the middle, which is a, middle, a bit of everything, so to speak. So this is therefore trying to show if you are more a technological believer, if you are someone who's more believing in society can change by itself, or if you're more believing in a strong political state, so to speak, um, or if you think it has to be a mixture of all of these things because otherwise we can't make it. So these are different things. Of course, all the slides can afterwards also be given to you. So. Um, just for your information. And interestingly enough, you can see now the results. It's of course, it's a lot of information on here. Once again, I'm trying to walk you through the diagrams. What you can see is the energy mix from 2015 until 2050 in all four diagrams. You can see that basically in these blackish brownish colors, you will see um, lignite, hard coal and oil. This is not only the electricity sector, but the transportation sector and the heating sector as well. So this is why you have also that much oil in there. Um, you can see natural gas and nuclear are the reddish colors. And then you have the renewables in green, blue and yellowish colors. Um, this is basically something you can see across all scenarios. You might be surprised that the energy demand is reduced that much. This is due to the higher efficiency simply. Um, this is if you are using a coal power plant or gas power plant, you have efficiency rates of 40 up to 60% at best. However, if you have renewable energies, you have nearly 100% efficiency, so to speak, if you just compare the primary energy input to the output ratio. Um, something that I think is interesting, even if I don't have time to go detailedly into the figures is that no matter in which of these four scenarios you believe in, the picture actually looks very similar. You will see that coal, these are the blackish dots, they go away all across Europe. This is for the entire Europe. In some cases, already in 2035, you hardly have any coal. In some other scenarios, you can see in 2050, there's a tiny bit left and then it fades away after 2050 only. There's a bit of gas, but gas, the reddish colors, they are always being reduced at a different speed, but they're always being reduced. There's no scenario where gas is rising. And you can see that renewables are always rising in all scenarios. The share is different. So for example, here in the blue scenario, you have a lot of PV, the yellow bars, they're relatively high. And in other scenarios, they are a bit smaller, but the general what's happening across all scenarios is very similar. And this is, I think the main message to understand. If we want to reach carbon neutrality, this goes in hand with some automatic consequences, basically a coal phase out very early, and later on oil and gas phase out. Due to the assumptions for the for the costs of nuclear, we don't see a nuclear renaissance in, of any kind. We see in two scenarios that there is basically no nuclear. We see two scenarios where there's a bit of nuclear, but at a lower amount there compared to today. So there is no time for nuclear renaissance simply because it's too expensive. Coming to the second top of my topic, um, the German Coal Commission, maybe just wrapping up a bit, what was the recommendation of the Coal Commission's decision in January 2019? Um, basically, some parts of the coal capacity, one third of the coal capacity will go offline by 2022. Um, and the second th third will basically go offline by 2030. And then the last share will go offline either 2035 or 2038 latest. So this is basically, it's more or less a linear reduction of coal until 
the mid, mid of the 2030s. This is basically what has been decided. In addition, the German government has announced that they will support the German coal regions with 40 billion in transitions. Um, this will mean 2 billion per year for 20 years. And it's important to say that these billions of transition support money, they are not necessarily additional money, but in some cases, anyhow, some investments had been planned in this region's construction of a new highway, building a new research center. So in some cases, it is also just a redirection of money or investing earlier or sometimes deciding to build a certain infrastructure, not in one village, but in, in a village that is affected by a coal mine. So therefore shifting investments and not necessarily additional investments. Costs and conditions for compensating the utilities are subject to the negotiations with the government. And this has been made in during the year of 2020. And they have basically reached an agreement. Not, not everything has been signed yet, but they are close, closing the deal now, um, which will basically cause additional um, compensation money, especially for Lignite companies. And the Coal Commission confirmed the target of 65% renewable share by 2030. Um, which before was at a lower rate. So basically these were the decisions by the German Coal Commission and the German Coal Commission's recommendations were more or less um, afterwards put into law by the German government. Um, there were some um, adjustments in some cases, which I might come to later. Um, what are the lessons learned of the Coal Commission and not only the commission, but the entire process that led to it beforehand? In general, we used to talk a lot about the fossil fuel based economy that is shifted to a decentralized renewable energy system. And this needs a change in the energy system. And this is really fancy. And a lot of engineers talk about this and it's really nice. And we tend to forget that there's a lot of other things that we need to incorporate as well. Um, just to mention some regional structure policy levels, we need to take care of the workers and citizens, the industry, the economy, infrastructure, not only being highways, but also being fast internet. We have the problem in Germany that we have, are in a COVID lockdown, and everybody's sitting home and a lot of places don't have fast internet connections, which is really embarrassing and people outside Germany don't believe us if we say so. Um, but we really are not good at implementing digital infrastructure and this is um, huge shortcoming if you want huge investors to come into your country and into your region. If you don't have internet access, there's no chance. Education and research facilities is very important for the future of people and soft location factors. Germany is a relatively rich country and people are, you might say, a bit spoiled. So therefore, just telling them you're going to have a job is not sufficient for them to stay within a region because they might decide to go to another region where they will also find a job, but they have a football club and they have a museum and they have a nice neighborhood where they want to live. So therefore, it is important to have this in mind because we will see in Germany, especially in the eastern part of Germany, there are regions where people leave the country and it's especially younger generations, it's especially women um, that basically leave the country. And this is basically a huge um, problem. In addition, there are aspects which in Germany, the financial system and the social security and pension system are working still relatively well, which make it easier to cope with such a just transition because we only have to take care of the workers until the age of 60 or 65. And then there's another system that takes care of them. This is not the case for all other countries and has to be kept in mind. In addition, the question of how do we govern this multi-level governance and planning participation of relevant stakeholders is very important because people in the coal regions in Germany, they didn't really like it if Berlin would tell them what to do. So basically the regions themselves want to decide what to do. They want the money to be given to them for them to choose whom to give it to and to have therefore also to a stronger identity for what is being built afterwards. And the people in coal regions have a tendency wanting to stay in energy regions. So therefore investing, for example, in renewable energies gets more support than investing only in tourism at, at actions. Um, something that is still important to note, if you look at the figures in Germany, I will jump a bit ahead, is that here you can see the jobs in the coal sector in Germany and you see the electricity share. This is the line on top how it evolved and that mining employees were reduced a lot in the last times. The share of electricity produced was reduced from 60% to 40% and we are actually now already at 25% only, so it was reduced even more. But interesting enough, the share of renewables, this is the green line, increased slowly 40%, now we're actually already at 50%. And 
there are more jobs that are also linked to the renewable energy sector, which is basically the positive side of the just transition as well. But it is important to note that these jobs are not always in the same villages, the same communities, and that in many cases, they are not as well paid as in the coal sector. So we have to fight more for better working conditions in the renewable energy sector and to make sure that some of these jobs also are being settled in the coal regions. So therefore, kicking off the discussions with some main findings from my side and also some comments with respect to lessons learned from the German example, maybe. Um, there are different pathways towards climate neutrality and I'm a modeler myself. I've been doing this for 10 years, but I still cannot tell you what how the future will look like. But we see some clear trends um, which are across all scenarios the same. All of them imply a coal exit. Ideally, especially to meet climate targets, we would need a coal phase out by 2030 across Europe. Of course, also Germany has only agreed on a phase up by 2035 to 2038, so this has to be increased. In addition, what we've seen in Germany already in the last two years, the situation changed a lot because the CO2 price in Europe has increased a bit more than we had anticipated, and the price of gas is also a bit cheaper than anticipated, and there's the COVID crisis and a lower electricity demand, etc. So therefore, my personal projection is that we will see a coal phase out in Germany in the early 2030s, maybe 2032 or 2031, due to economic reasoning. And the now agreed on political phase out by 2035, 2038 will be adopted at some stage simply because it's too expensive to run a coal power plant at a certain stage if renewables increase the rate the way that they're doing it now. In addition, there is no room and there's no need for additional investment in fossil gas, as well as for nuclear investments. We don't see this in any of our modeling. Nuclear is too expensive and there's no room for gas if we want to meet climate targets because fossil gas also has CO2 emissions that do not comply with carbon neutrality. And therefore, for Europe, but also across the world, 100% renewable energy supply is the cheapest and the only technological solution and it is out there so this is something that we see that is already possible um, we already see a lot of hours in germany where we have rates of renewable electricity exceeding 70 percent in certain days and this is not a problem with respect to energy security we have the had the news report this year that the, the risk of a blackout in Germany is as low as it has never been before. So the energy security is remaining stable, not necessarily because of the renewables, but because technology is getting better and because also the engineers in the, in the offices do a good job in regulating all this. It's not getting easier for them, but they're doing a good job and they're catching up with it. This is a good thing. I think it is important to note that different challenges prevail for countries and regions to enable just transition. It is more difficult for Germany to do so than it is, for example, for France, I would say. However, it is, of course, also more difficult for Czech Republic and for Poland or for Bulgaria than to do it for Germany, as we have more financial means. What we've seen in Germany in the discussion of the German coal phase out, it's important to talk with everyone, to bring everyone on the table. It is, however, also important to tell people that we are not discussing if there will be a coal phase out or not, but we are just discussing when exactly it will be and how we will compensate the regions and how we will take care of it. But it is important to start thinking of a plan B now and denying that there is a need for change and denying that actually coal power plants, if you include all the costs that they um, lead to are uh, not an option. This is important to note. So therefore, I'm very happy that I'm invited to speak here. I'm very high interested to share um, my experiences with you and looking forward to the discussion with you because I think it's very important to discuss this together and there's a lot of things we can learn from one another. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Oe. I think, uh, thank you very much for this interesting figure, for being on time and wrapping up uh, this very complex study and uh, well, in a couple of major conclusions, there were a number of quite interesting takeaways from your presentation that I would like to keep uh, later for the discussion. One of it is that you mentioned that carbon neutrality could be reached without uh, the need for negative emissions and negative emissions are already for are foreseen into the IP IPCC scenarios and some of the European roadmap scenarios. Then. Another interesting finding for me, and especially in the context of many countries announcing a nuclear revival is that, uh, well, including a nuclear option for the long-term decarbonization would be quite a costly uh, option. And then we could achieve um, a basically carbon neutrality with a switch to 100% renewables in combination probably with other measures. 
but without the need for nuclear energy and fossil fuel gas investments. These are all subject to controversial discussions in Southeast Europe, so I would like to keep. And then another quite important conclusion that you mentioned is that decentralized renewable energy will play a, will play a major role for the 2050 targets. Okay, uh, we'll take these points later for the discussion because I would like to introduce our uh, next speaker, um, uh, Damiana Stoyanova. I had the pleasure to know Damiana Stoyanova from my work uh, and particularly on energy transition and climate policies in Brussels. She is currently a member of the cabinet of uh, Franz Timmermans and uh, well, the whole team of Franz Timmermans is, are already, is already leading the, the work on the European Green Deal and the first in its kind European climate law you know, uh, which is going to enshrine the 2050 climate neutrality target in the EU law, but it also includes a new target for the 2030 uh, emissions reduction. And last month, uh, the European Parliament voted for increasing the target to 60% of emission reduction for 2030, which means uh, reviewing also uh, some of the targets that member states are having. Uh, and also, he's also coordinating the work on the Just Transition Fund, uh, which is quite, which will play a very important role, and particularly for Eastern Europe, for restructuring the core regions, and in order to support those that are most affected by the um, uh, by the transition. Uh, two important things for the Just Transition Fund novelty, uh, basic novelties are that the Just Transition Fund will be linked very much to the um, uh, climate conditionality and to the rule of law which will set uh, basically new conditions uh, for, uh, for how this fund is going to be distributed and used. So it needs to be tightly linked to climate policies. Um, um, Damiana Stoyanova, she is going to focus on uh, the European climate policy for 2050 and also the opportunities resulting from for the European Green Deal uh, what is the pathway that the Commission is foreseeing? Uh, what are the different, uh, what, what the Commission is expecting from member states? How could they best prepare and what is the current timeline? Thank you very much, everyone. My name is Damiana Stoinova, uh, just with this uh, little correction. And I'm very happy to be part of this discussion today. As Radostina already introduced me, I work currently in the cabinet of the Executive uh, Vice President Timmermans. But I'm uh, working for the Commission already since 10 years. And I also had the opportunity to uh, support the Bulgarian presidency. Uh, a few years ago and to work closely with Buriana, which is also part of, uh, of this panel and I'm very happy about this. So indeed today uh, I would like to give you a little bit the, the big picture on the European policy for 2050, for 2030, but uh, also the benefits that, that result from this. As uh, many of you have already said, the European Green Deal is uh, the blueprint for, for rebuilding Europe. It's our new growth strategy. And uh, we have launched this ambitious strategy already at the beginning of the mandate. And the guiding goal of the European Green Deal is the 2050 objective of climate neutrality. This objective has been endorsed by European leaders. But uh, in addition to that, we wanted to put this into legislation and to make it legally binding. That's why uh, already in March this year, we have proposed the climate law uh, with the main objective that the long-term objective becomes legislation. This climate law has um, is being already discussed by the co-legislators, uh, as it was already mentioned, the European Parliament also formed its position um, asking, among others, also for 60% emissions reductions by 2030. Also in the Council, uh, we have reached a partial uh, general approach so that the trilogues also on the climate law can, can start soon. And the ambition of the German presidency is to reach an agreement by the end of the year. So that's about uh, about the long term, and uh, as also the colleague from the Technical University in um, in, in Berlin said, uh, indeed there are many different pathways to to reach climate neutrality in 2050. There is not only one way to do that, but there are uh, of course several trends um, or no regret options, which um, is very encouraged to to follow. With the current measures that we have on the table, however, we are going to reach only 60% emissions reductions by 2050. So it is very clear that we need new instruments and new policies in order to arrive at this goal that we have set for ourselves. 
But 2050 is so far away, and uh, that's why um, we have focused also on the midterm and our 2030 objective. So far, the EU 2030 goal was to uh, reduce emissions, or still is, to reduce emissions with at least 40% by 2030. But the Commission has proposed in September to increase this objective to at least 55%. And with this also to strengthen the, the European leadership also at the international level. Uh, this objective has been already discussed by European leaders and uh, they have decided to come back to this issue in December in view of reaching an agreement uh, following some further consultations with the member states. The goal now is to, to um, agree on the overall objective and then the details of how the different policies and instruments would contribute to that and how it would be translated into different sectors and also uh, what would be the distribution of, um, of effort between the member states will be decided later on when we make the legislative proposals for, for specific policies. For instance, um, uh, this would be a revision of the emissions trading system, um, which currently um, covers the energy and the industry sectors, but uh, we would look into possibly expanding this also to transport and to buildings. There will be also a revision of the effort sharing regulation, of the regulation covering uh, land use and land use change, and also of the standards for um, CO2 for cars and vans. So all this legislative proposal would follow in June next year. So uh, these discussions would uh, would come later. And of course, there uh, then also member states would find out more, more details on what this European more ambitious objective concretely means for the for the different member states. So that's uh, where we are with uh, with our 2030 proposal. There are also other um, accompanying policies and strategies uh, that have been adopted in the past months or that will uh, still fall in the next months, maybe just to mention the renovation wave uh, that would come in autumn. So this could be, I think, something very interesting also for Bulgaria, given that uh, there is a big potential uh, also for improvement of uh, energy efficiency of, uh, of buildings and for renovating of the, of the existing ones. Uh, there would be also an uh, offshore energy strategy coming in the next months. And there is also the um, carbon border adjustment mechanism uh, on which the Commission is working and which is of uh, big interest for our international partners in particular, because the aim of this policy instrument is to put carbon price on imports of goods from countries that uh, have not engaged into a comparable uh, climate effort uh, like uh, the one of the European Union. Now I would just uh, like to say also a few words about um, supporting financially this, uh, this great effort because um, uh, also for the first time um, the European Union has committed uh, itself that a large part of its long-term budget but also of this new recovery instrument the next generation eu package would be dedicated to climate um, to climate goals um, the objective for climate mainstreaming of this uh, really very big financial resource will be 30 percent and that was increased compared to to the uh, last budgetary budgetary period where it was 20 percent and the commission proposal was 25 but then through the discussions that was increased to 30. so this is really also um, again a historic opportunity and uh, it is up to the to the member states uh, to see how they can make uh, the best use out out of this resource which is there uh, as to the benefits resulting from from uh, climate action many of them are uh, have been already mentioned also by radustina for instance the first mover advantage um, also now that we would go for a more ambitious 2030 objective that would give um, the different sectors more time to prepare for this inevitable green transition uh, there are multiple benefits for for health and well-being and in particular now in the in the current covid context i think many of us uh, realize also the importance of uh, of this aspect another uh, benefit is of course uh, green jobs um, just to give you one one figure green jobs have increased with uh, 50 percent percent compared to 2000 and the trend is that uh, they they also keep on increasing and uh, and growing there would be less imports of, uh, of fossil fuels and also we would be avoiding the the cost of of non action which is uh, always very difficult to put a, a number on it but it's uh, but it's also significant 
Um, as my, my boss, the executive vice president, very often says, this whole transition needs to be just, or if it's not just, it will not happen. And uh, this social aspect of the, um, of the decarbonization and of the green transition is very, very important for our work. And that's why we have put a lot of efforts also um, on um, mechanisms that could uh, uh, help to, to minimize the negative effects. Because, of course, not everybody would uh, win from this low carbon transition. There would be some certain sectors, certain regions that uh, might experience some negative um, effects. And that's why we have come forward also with the Just Transition Mechanism and the Just Transition Fund in, in this context with the goal to, to support these uh, sectors and regions that could experience uh, these difficulties. Uh, and I would like to finish also with the international aspect, because this is also an area that uh, I actually follow closely in the, in the cabinet, the international climate negotiations. Uh, it is clear that um, no matter how ambitious we are in the European Union, we cannot uh, solve the, the climate uh, problem ourselves. Our uh, percentage of global emissions keep on uh, decreasing. Uh, currently, it is something like um, eight, nine percent of, uh, of global emissions. And that's why it is very important that we work also with international partners. And um, by showing um, the European example and the European model, by showing that this works, uh, we are inspiring also other uh, major economies to, to take comparable uh, measures. In fact, the, in the European Union, we have already a very good track record of reducing our emissions and growing our economy at the same time to show that the one is not uh, at the cost of the other. Um, since uh, 1990 and now, our economy grew by 62% and for the same time, our emissions were reduced by 25%. And this is a very powerful message that we uh, always use also in uh, international contexts. And uh, in the past weeks, we have seen actually uh, very ambitious um, announcements by other international partners. For instance, China um, has announced that uh, they would aim to become carbon neutral by 2060. Japan and South Korea also came forward just in the, in the last weeks to announce uh, climate neutrality by 2050. So these are actually very positive news. Uh, I would like to welcome now uh, Boriana Kamenova, who is already part of the... Um... Uh, well, she's the director of the Climate uh, Change Policy Department of the Bulgarian Ministry for Environment. And she's already part of the team, which is already working on this long-term uh, decarbonization strategy for 2050. From what I understood, uh, already the, um, the Minister of Environment in Bulgaria is preparing currently a final draft that will be already uh, ready for negotiations uh, soon. Uh, so, uh, Buriana, first of all, many thanks for your last minute jumping into this uh, discussion. We very much appreciate that you are joining us on board. And uh, I think um, many, many of the participants would, be, would like to know what is the current timeline for the Bulgarian decarbonization strategies? What would be the priorities uh, for 2050? Where do you think the biggest challenges will lie? and what kind of support uh, we will need from the EU. Uh, good morning. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank uh, CSD for the possibility to be a speaker at uh, today's uh, webinar, uh, which I consider to be extremely useful uh, for the purpose of promoting the Green Agenda. Uh, first of all, uh, some general remarks. Um, of course, uh, the Green Agenda and the Green Deal require a complete um, transformation, and this places a great burden on governments to send uh, the right direction and provide the necessary support. Uh, however, the transition provides uh, not only challenges, but also opportunities. Uh, and uh, a transition of such uh, magnitude can be only successful if it is supported uh, by um, the entire society. Um, yes, uh, reducing the energy intensity of the economy can be achieved uh, through the implementation of activities 
to introduce low carbon technologies in enterprises, improving the energy efficiency of buildings and promoting energy from re renewable sources. Um, and uh, one very important thing for the transition is uh, um, transition to a circular and resilient efficient economy. Uh, so um, one of our priorities is to reduce the resource intensity in the country's economy and increase the producti productivity of resources throughout their life cycle. Um, interventions can be aimed at reducing the amount of uh, waste generated in the production process, reducing the amount of raw materials used in production, uh, stimulating the use of alternative raw materials and increasing the use of recyclable materials. Uh, synergies between the green and digital transition are of key importance to achieving the transition to climate neutrality. Uh, so digitalization uh, plays and will play a key role in driving the circular and low carbon economy by providing uh, and uh, exchanging data on products and materials between actors uh, in value chains. Uh, concerning the long term strategy, um, yeah, we are working on long term strategy of Bulgaria. Towards the end of the year, we hope that we'll have a uh, um, draft ready for uh, public discussion. Uh, we'll put uh, this draft for public discussion. But uh, all sectors must uh, contribute to reducing emissions, increasing efficiency and uh, innovation, promoting improvements. Uh, in, uh, um, in in the sectors. Um, so the main um, ways to, to achieve this uh, is uh, through circular economy. Um, hydrogen use will play a key role in the future uh, as fuel or feedstock. And uh, for us, um, carbon capture and storage and use um, will be a general application which could apply to, to the flue gas from combustion from process activities. Um, as uh, this can be applied to different uh, industrial sectors, it is currently considered one of the most promising technologies to reduce process emissions, although the technology is currently not mature. Um, the transition uh, to carbon neutrality implies a systematic transformation of the structure and operation of the current uh, economic system, uh, which at the uh, national level may represent more opportunities uh, than risks. Um, and uh, the carbon neutrality will drive the acquisition of new skills as well as the creation of new business uh, models. Um, of course, uh, there are opportunities for new business, new business models and the creation of new clusters with uh, network generation, for example, in the sectors related to renewable energy production automation engineering core services and logistics uh, associated with uh, shared and automotive mobility. Uh, we did some uh, energy and climate modeling using uh, a special tool developed uh, for, for our countries, uh, for our country called the Bulgarian Energy System Tool Best uh, Model. So that's all from my side, thank you. Uh, so it's a great pleasure right now to welcome uh, Mr. Jechu Stankov, uh, who is the Vice Minister of Energy. He is one of the driving forces behind uh, the green energy transition in Bulgaria. And also at the European stage, he is more known as a negotiator on behalf of the Bulgarian presidency of the Clean Energy Package in 2018. Uh, 
uh, when he contributed to the successful negotiations of the clean energy package, which set the 2030 energy and climate target. Uh, so Mr. Stankov, um, could you now tell us more about since uh, energy would be a major sector in decarbonizing the Bulgarian economy? Could you tell us a bit more of a preview? What are the priorities for the Bulgarian energy sectors until 2030 and 2050? And also uh, we had um, um, in particular a couple of questions uh, from the audience. Maybe you could reflect it in your presentation is how the future of the coal regions in Bulgaria will look will look like according to you the transition uh do you see a successful transition to other types of industries for example renovating in terms of renovating the business sector how could we better also align uh, the current national recovery and resilience plan also with with our priorities in the energy sector Thank you very much. Thank you very much. First of all, I want to thank the Center for the Study of the De Democracy, especially uh, Ruslan, uh, Yosef, Rodustina, and Martin for the good communication. Also, uh, Phil and Dank for uh, and, uh, the colleague from Friedrich Eber Stiftung. It's really a great pleasure, and the topic today is of uh, huge importance. Thank you also for the nice work, uh, words at the beginning of the today's session. What is the Green Deal as uh, overall? Uh, let's say, deal uh, the car carbon neutral economy until 2050. Uh, Bulgaria joined this during the uh, the, the meeting, the, the high level meeting uh, in Brussels, the, the on the European Council, and of course uh, we are developing the necessary uh, documentation and strategies related with this. Now, of course, uh, the, the most important discussion is concentrated on the uh, mid-term or short-term um, uh, targets until 2030. I'm telling short-term because uh, in the point of view of the energy sector, 10 years is a really uh, short-term uh, perspective. Uh, we see uh, the, the, the different, uh, different uh, ways of uh, proceeding in the parliament and the council uh, with the 55 to 60 percent. Of course, uh, the when we speak about the greenhouse gas emissions, we could say that about 70%, 70 to 80% from the greenhouse gas emissions are CO2 emissions, and maybe between 60, 70% of them are coming from the energy sector, which means it's potential in the energy sector, but uh, huge potential also in the other sectors. What are we doing at the moment uh, for achieving uh, uh, better targets? Uh, of course, First of all, after the, the published Green Deal and uh, the related framework related with the just transition mechanism, we started working very hard with our colleagues from the European Commission for, uh, uh, let's say, uh, finding uh, additional money to the member states for technical support. Uh, thanks God, there were a small piece of, uh, of uh, the budget which was uh, sent in this direction, 3.4 million euro were uh, uh, started as an open call to the member states. 18 member states uh, win uh, from this uh, technical support. And I'm proud that Bulgaria had the opportunity to take 15% share from this money uh, for the preparation of the three very important uh, transition plans. Uh, that, that's the plans for uh, Maritza East region, for uh, uh, Pernik region and Kustindio region. Uh, here, I'm also very glad to say that uh, with the uh, colleagues from the Center for the Study of the Democracy, we, we uh, many times discussed uh, uh, the whole three regions and the possible proceeding uh, and possible measures which could be included there. And it will be a pleasure to, uh, they also to be involved uh, in the future discussion after the, the consultant uh, from the side of the Commission will be chosen. What we expect to happen in these regions, of course, it's not just a political decision. We want uh, to speak with the people in the regions, to the industry in the regions, and really to, uh, to develop this, uh, to, to keep the competitiveness of these regions, because uh, the money we are receiving from the Just Transition Fund, which are 1.2 uh, billion euro, have to be injected into these regions. But uh, our personal opinion is not only to these three regions, because uh, uh, I'm sure the, the colleague from Germany uh, we'll also uh, confirm this, that, that not only the coal regions are affected by the transition, because we are speaking here not 
not for financing the energy transition, we are speaking for financing the economic transition. That means that uh, the regions where, where the labor force, force is coming from, the, the regions which are uh, where we find the link industry to these coal regions, the energy intensive industry should also be included, or that means that the regions should be uh, not only these three regions, but also the regions with the energy intensive industry and the people uh, in the regions with the working force. Of course, uh, here we're expecting after the, the start of the, the, to, to the, the work of the consultant, in the next 12 months, this, uh, this um, plans to be uh, well prepared, uh, deeply discussed with the NGOs, people in the region, uh, the industry, the stakeholders as all, all and uh, they to be uh, sent to the European Commission and after approval for starting uh, preparing the project projects uh, on these places. Good to say is that in these regions we can see uh, already a uh, good organization uh, here. It's uh, very important to say that the Just Transition Fund and the, the plans and the mechanisms, uh, we are working very hard to the second and third pillar with the EIB uh, to see what kind of uh, uh, pipeline of project in addition, I mean, uh, for, for the energy transition could be also financed in these regions. Uh, just transition mechanism is just one of the possible instruments to, to develop and or to, to go through this, uh, uh, let's say, decarbonization uh, future. And um, the, the, the second one, it was mentioned also by the uh, colleagues uh, um, Stoinova, which uh, uh, was also uh, mentioning many times the recovery resilience uh, fund and the money which is expected there. As you know, Bulgaria is expecting 6.2 billion euro as a grant and 4.5 billion as a uh, loans. Uh, it's very important to say that uh, on, on our projects which were provided uh, and uh, we are planning to discuss in the next few weeks with the stakeholders, we were led by the assessment from the side of the European Commission related with the uh, national energy and climate plans. And there were three very important topics. First of all, uh, integration for new renewables, Second of all, energy efficiency in the very, very dramatic buildings, uh, which are very poor from the side of energy efficiency. And third, but not last, uh, keep the transformation in the uh, energy markets and investment in the, uh, uh, let's say, uh, energy lines for electrification. Uh, all these three things are fully included in our recovery resilience plan uh, on the uh, we keep fully the rules of Europe. 37% of the money will be directed for green projects in the, under the name from Green Bulgaria. Uh, uh, and uh, 3 billion level or 1.5 billion uh, euro will be directly uh, uh, for energy efficiency, energy in efficiency in combination with renewables, of course, um, upgrading the existing national uh, program for uh, a renovation of the multifamily buildings. Uh, of course, there uh, we're gonna switch not only on the class C building, we're gonna upgrade this to class B and class A with combination with, uh, with renewables. We're gonna not invest only in, uh, in uh, uh, multifamily buildings, but also in uh, uh, single family buildings, which will give the opportunity to, of course, to leave nobody behind. We are not speaking once again for just packaging the building with new new windows, new uh, new isolation, but also solar panels, PV panels, uh, new uh, new uh, class A installations, which uh, which to decrease the energy consumption, uh, giving the opportunity and uh, going into the model of Germany of uh, energy societies and uh, more and more prosumers than consumers uh, in our, our energy system. Uh, of course, here uh, I cannot uh, uh, miss to, to, to tell you that we are planning also a uh, half billion uh, level also, uh, which going to be injected to the transmission lines, which is very important for us for giving opportunity 
Many thanks, Mr. Stanko, for outlining uh, the very practical steps ahead and also some of the concrete measures that are planned in terms of uh, energy transition. Um, I would like uh, to introduce now our uh, next uh, speaker. So the just transition process is, does not only pose very complex administrative, political and economic challenges, but also huge uh, social challenges. And particularly in Bulgaria, it is the coal mines are the source of incomes uh, for many, uh, for a couple of regions and also um, the insure employment. So it's, we did a calculation at the Center for the Study of Democracy that 14,000 workers directly and 20,000 workers indirectly will be affected by this just transition and they need uh, their also fair compensation what role the future Just Transition Fund will play, how it could be combined with further measures. So I think uh, our next speaker is very, uh, very well placed to reply to some of these questions. Um, this is Ludovic Voet. He's the um, Confederal Secretary of the European Trade Union Confederation. So the organization, the Umbrella Association, which is representing the trade, it is the voice of the trade unions in Europe. And he's, talk, he's going to talk about more how we are going to prepare this industrial restructuring in, in the regions, how we could ensure job security, compensation for the workers, that the social, that no one is left behind, and particularly the most disadvantaged ones are taken care of. And they also offer opportunities for green economic recovery. So how we could combine it also with the uh, green economic recovery package. Uh, so the floor is yours, Ludovic. Many thanks for accepting our invitation. Thank you. Uh, it's good to be with you. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, yeah, so first of all, it's important uh, for us as ETUC and as trade union movement to say that, uh, yeah, climate change is here and now, so there is no doubt about it. Uh, we are in favor of uh, an ambitious uh, climate action as there are no jobs on a dead planet and the status quo is no solution. So the question is therefore not whether or not we achieve climate neutrality by 2050, but rather how do we move toward this goal. For trade unions, the only possible answer is uh, the need for a just transition. Transition must be fair, uh, both in terms of output, so it should reduce inequalities and improve well-being, but also in terms of process. So workers and their communities should be involved uh, in the design of the climate policies through social uh, dialogue. A just transition should support workers, communities and region most affected. This point is important as new jobs created in green industries will not automatically coincide geographically with jobs that will be lost in other sectors uh, such as, uh, as coal. So of course, if we uh, create jobs in uh, offshore uh, wind, uh, it's not at the same place than uh, where we, co uh, we closed down uh, coal mines. So this uh, has to be taken into account because these vulnerable regions will, uh, will uh, need financial support and sound industrial policies to manage the, uh, the, ch uh, the change ahead. But of course, don't get me wrong, uh, there are opportunities for coal regions. A recent uh, commission study find that uh, 315,000 jobs could be created in coal regions by 2030 by deploying clean energy production technologies. This number goes up to 460,000 by 2050. The same study, however, finds that 43 billion euros would be need to be invested in coal regions only to reach that potential. So this shows the need for financial support for the coal region. We as ETUC are in favor of a just transition in these regions. However, we are worried when we see that the EU Council decide to reduce the amount of the just transition fund from 40 uh, billion uh, euros initially proposed by the Commission to 17.5 uh, billion. This, do this does not send the right uh, signal to workers and as I showed before, uh, the needs for financial support uh, are important. We should also keep in mind that many workers in these regions will see their jobs completely transformed or sometimes of course lost uh, so uh, in the coal sectors and fossil or the fossil fuel industry, for example, uh, these workers should be supported and provide with new opportunities. 
the fact that new jobs will uh, be created uh, does not mean that these new jobs will be accessible uh, to those who lost theirs. So it was uh, correctly mentioned by, um, by our German uh, uh, in, uh, colleague. Um, indeed, a coal miner cannot from one day to another turn into a wind turbine expert as a, or a construction worker. So we need active labor market policies, training and reskilling program. Uh, there will be uh, necessary. During the time of this transition, it is also important that workers and their communities can rely on good social protection so that they do not uh, lose uh, their uh, income and that they can continue with their community to live in decent conditions. We will need for this solidarity mechanism and effective public services. When thinking the transition, it is also important not to oppose green versus uh, brown industries. Indeed, uh, in order to build offshore uh, wine mills, solar panels, or to renovate buildings, we will need a lot of steel, aluminium, and cement, which are at the moment produced by industries that are highly energy intensive. So these industries, therefore, will need support to achieve a successful transition as well to a low carbon um, economy. For us, it is clear that the transition should be designed in a way that supports all European workers. It should create employment, maintain your, uh, European industry in Europe and provide better working conditions to EU citizens. The last point that I would mention is crucial and sometimes underestimated by policymakers. To take an example, renovation of buildings should help create many local jobs, for example. However, in the moment, jobs in construction sector are often poor quality jobs with social dumping, zero hour contracts, etc. This is not what we want. Similarly, when we look at circular economy, it has the potential to create many jobs. However, we see currently that jobs in repair of waste management are often associated with precarious work and blurry health and safety condition in the waste management sector. This is, of course, also not what we want. The same goes for off offshore wind. This new industry has a lot of potential to tackle the climate crisis. We have heard uh, that it could create 3.5 uh, uh, million jobs in the next 20 years. However, it should be made sure we, we should make sure, uh, sure that these jobs are quality jobs. I have in mind here the story of the Beatrice Offshore Wind project where undocumented workers were paid fraction of the minimum wage. So when we create new jobs in new sector of the economy to, uh, to provide uh, new solutions to, wor uh, to workers and communities, uh, we should also discuss about the quality of the jobs and the working conditions. I will conclude on this. For us, as trade union uh, movement, it is crucial that the Green Deal is also a green and social deal. The Gilets Jaunes in France has told us that the climate transition is not just about uh, technologies and market forces. It is first and foremost about people and fairness. For the European Trade Union Confederation, a successful Green Deal will be a program that creates decent jobs, ensure better working conditions and enhance workers' participation. This will only be achieved through solidarity, sound industrial policy, fair redistribution and the setting of minimum social standards. Here the discussion about the minimum wage uh, at European level that we uh, have at the moment is important to act that people access decent wages social protection coverage uh, in the transition and the need for collective bargaining uh, is important. At all stages of the process, social dialogue and involvement of workers will be uh, key to ensure uh, that they support the climate uh, policies and to ensure that uh, their uh, problems are really taken into account. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Mr. Voet, for highlighting some of these current uh, social challenges of the just transition process and that they also need to be taken in, into account when designing national policy measures for a just transition. Uh, so now we are coming to our uh, final speaker. This is my colleague, Martin Vladimirov, who is a senior energy uh, specialist, energy analyst at the Center for the Study of Democracy. I have the pleasure to work with him on several projects. He's going to present something to you about uh, a new tool that we are using in order to model uh, long-term uh, decarbonization scenarios. 
and then he's going to give a preview of some of the decarbonization challenges that according to us are uh, key and need to be addressed uh, also by Bulgaria uh, well in the coming years. So the floor is yours, Martin. Thank you very much, Rados, and uh, thank you to all speakers who have participated uh, in this discussion. I think uh, very valuable opinions were, uh, were shared and also very interesting conclusions of yet another uh, model of the future, of the future energy system. And uh, what are the challenges related to the, the, to the great transformations that we're going to see in the next three decades. Um, I'll share my screen to show you a little bit more about this, the model that Rados mentioned. Just a second. So um, in the past more, more or less two years, we have been working uh, with the support of the European Climate Foundation together with uh, um, the Klimakt Institute in Belgium, uh, which is developing uh, a very ambitious all economy model, um, which uh, is trying to um, uh, develop different trajectories and different pathways to decarbonization until 2050. And um, um, this model allows actually policymakers and experts all around Europe to play a little bit with the different indicators and the different levels that would uh, need to change in the next uh, couple of decades so that we reach a uh, 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 um, uh, zero carbon Europe by 2050. So it's a very useful tool. It's, uh, it's an open source tool. Um, and uh, CSD has worked with clim climate on the Bulgarian assumptions and the Bulgarian uh, uh, pathways, the different pathways, in order to make the model uh, as realistic as possible and to make it as useful as possible for policymakers and experts. So um, this presentation is also an introduction to uh, uh, hopefully a future interaction and a future uh, cooperation with the energy ministry and environmental ministry in Bulgaria uh, uh, so that we can uh, share with you the, 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 the tool, uh, explain to you how you can use it and uh, try to work out some alternative scenarios um, uh, that, can be, uh, that, uh, that can be also useful for defining policy measures in the next years. So I'm going to go through the model a little bit, uh, discuss how it works. Uh, and then I'll show just uh, briefly examples of some of the findings uh, for Bulgaria, uh, some of the different decarbonization trajectories that can be seen on emissions, on energy demand, on renewable energy uh, share in, in the final demand so that you can take a, a brief look at uh, uh, what we're trying to achieve. And then I'll finally, I'll, I'll, I'll conclude my presentation by talking about uh, certain policy realities that we see right now, uh, especially related to long-term energy planning uh, and some policy visions or recommendations that we can, uh, 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 we can introduce so that Bulgarian energy policy in the future is more ambitious uh, and um, is more realistic towards uh, achieving the, the net zero um, uh, goals. So this is a snapshot of the CLIMAC tool that we have also worked on in the past uh, two years. And it shows um, how you can basically um, understand the different changes in the economy that would need to take place in the next three decades in order to achieve 100% uh, decarbonization. And um, on the left side, you have a panel of the different indicators, the different levers that can be manipulated, that can be changed in order to see how uh, the trajectories shift depending on the different ambition level that you're trying to uh, uh, integrate or in implement. There are four different ambition levels. I'm going to speak about them uh, in a second. But I just wanted to show you the, the interface. It's very interactive. Um, it's going to be very easy for, for, for policymakers and experts to uh, change the future and, and build their own trajectory, their own scenario that seems more realistic, uh, most realistic and uh, 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 um, 
most uh, adapt to the policy reality and to the possibilities uh, of each country. So Climark has, by the way, developed this model for uh, six countries. Uh, they piloted in Belgium, but it's, is now being developed for Bulgaria, Romania, Hungary, Czech Republic, and Greece. Um, and we're still working on it. We're finalizing some of the uh, data verification, but uh, it's more, we are almost there. So the four ambition levels, um, as you can see here, um, follow a very similar logic as other models. We have a current ambition level one, uh, which is really a reference scenario in which uh, 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 we extrapolate historical trends in the future. So uh, it's basically a, a baseline scenario, business as usual. Uh, there is level two, which is increased ambition. So um, basically uh, the current uh, implementation uh, and introduction of uh, technologies, but uh, their use is being expanded. Uh, it's more extended. Uh, so we see some shifts in uh, the use of uh, uh, alternative technologies, uh, but more or less, we are still on a business as usual scenario with a little bit more ambition. Uh, the level three and level four are a little bit more transformational um, uh, because they include significant changes in our behavior, uh, personally as, as individuals and collectively as society but they also include significant shifts in technology use. So uh, um, uh, level three um, 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 uses mainly available technologies, but on a much uh, um, bigger scale that is not possible currently with the current level of technology development, but, um, uh, but takes into consideration already piloted projects around Europe, which show that uh, with uh, efficiency gains, these newer technologies or this newer implementation of the technology could be transformational for certain sectors like uh, transportation, buildings, uh, agriculture, etc. And of course, level four is transformational. It requires uh, an enormous change in the way we live, in our lifestyles, in the way we eat, our diet, uh, the way we move. So the, the modes of transportation, not only from a technological level, but also uh, our preferences for using bikes, for example, including for walking, including for using railway versus uh, uh, um, vehicles. Uh, so this is a this is a very important uh, uh, um, uh, shift that requires not only a directional policy shift, uh, a top-down policy shift, but changes in perception, uh, changes in social acceptance of decarbonization changes in the way people uh, uh, understand uh, uh, you know, climate change in general. And this is more or less kind of a, a very simplified vision of how the different ambitions can be implemented in, in the future. Um, and uh, the big difference between the more ambitious scenarios and the less ambitious scenarios is the, um, the, the gradualness of, of the shift. So the more ambitious scenarios would require changes in our way of life and in, in the technology that is being used already in the 2020s. While the, the less ambitious scenarios uh, uh, envision changes beyond 2035. It's important to know though, that in the end, all scenarios aim at the same point. So 100% decarbonization, but the pathway is very different and could require many different uh, 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 investments, much more investment in the future if, if we are less ambitious now. Um, but it's important to know that uh, for all countries, there, there are some uh, convergence kind of indicators. So all countries need to achieve a certain target uh, and some countries uh, would need to invest more, would need to do more than other countries. There is also the compression argument in which um, all countries need to, to achieve a certain percentage decline, for example, in energy consumption uh, or in food consumption. Um, uh, uh, but um, depending on the level, the starting level, the ambition and uh, the policy changes are different. And this is just a bit more on the model. Uh, it, as I mentioned, it's an all economy model. So it includes not only energy, but also buildings, transportation, industry, and agriculture. 
Uh, and as you can see here, it's a bottom-up model in the sense that we start with the demand, so with demand preferences. So we, we are talking about lifestyle, so how people eat, how people move, uh, how people build uh, 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 buildings, uh, how they use appliances. And based on this lifestyle and these demand patterns, we can estimate the necessary food production, the necessary uh, 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 production of uh, transportation vehicles, uh, uh, the level of uh, 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 new buildings, uh, uh, renovation, manufacturing. So based on the demand, the supply is ex estimated in the future. And based on the supply that is necessary to satisfy demand and changing demand for that matter, we estimate energy supply. So how much energy is needed to produce the goods that are needed to satisfy the demand that we have. Um, based on this energy demand uh, and then materials demand, we can estimate what are the emissions uh, and how emissions need to decline in the future so that we reach our targets. We also include transboundary effects. So we're talking about imports and exports and how some countries can compensate uh, uh, they are domestic kind of interventions with more exports from, uh, uh, from other countries with, uh, uh, with, reject, with more ambitious uh, low carbon trajectories. And this is just again a snapshot uh, of, uh, of the model for Bulgaria. This is greenhouse gas emissions by scenario. And as you can see uh, in the reference scenario, we don't really see much change in green greenhouse gas emissions, partially because without much change in the energy sector, which is the leading uh, uh, kind of uh, 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 the leading share of emissions in Bulgaria, um, we wouldn't see a much change in the next three decades. Uh, but from ambition two to ambition four, as you can see, there is little difference. Uh, the, the main driving factor uh, is energy uh, and the steeper uh, um, energy demand uh, uh, goes down and um, the more implementation of renewable energy technologies in the system, as you see a steeper decline in greenhouse gas emissions. It is important to clarify though that without major introduction of renewable energy technology in the other sectors, in industry, in transportation, uh, and in agriculture, uh, and without a, a change in also in the patterns of consumption in the future, especially I would say in, in industry and in, and in the agricultural sector, it will be almost impossible for Bulgaria to reach its targets. So it's not only about energy. Energy is a major factor. It's probably the most important factor about Bulgarian long-term decarbonization strategy, but it's not the only factor that will determine our success. Uh, similarly, I'm going to uh, show you uh, the values for energy demand and renewable energy composition uh, 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 in Bulgaria. And you see the reference scenario is very bleak because it actually shows an increase in energy demand due to rising uh, economic standards, uh, living standards, uh, rising GDP. Uh, it wouldn't, so energy savings would not be able to compensate uh, uh, for, 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 for the rising economic activity in the country. Uh, and as you can see, renewable energy share stays more, mostly the same. So this is, this, this is a very pessimistic scenario. I don't believe it's realistic because obviously the Bulgarian government is already implementing uh, significant changes to, to its strategies uh, for, to 2030. That would uh, definitely reduce energy demand and would increase renewable energy in the system. Um, I think that uh, the, the ambition free uh, picture is more realistic towards what, what we're going to see in the next uh, maybe 20 years, you, you see significant increase in uh, renewable energy in the energy system. Uh, it reaches around 40, uh, 50 percent by 2030, uh, which is more or less in line with the European Commission objectives. Uh, and you see steep decline in energy demand. Uh, probably what we see now in the NECP uh, is a mixture between ambition two and ambition three, but uh, that's that's exactly why the, the, the model is so uh, uh, useful because you can combine different ambitions. So you can have an ambition free for buildings and ambition to for energy, and you got, you're going to get a mix uh, 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 which is more realistic and more relevant to, you, to the country situation. 
So this is this is very useful, uh, and I hope uh, we can we can speak to experts in the energy ministry and the environmental ministry and teach them how to use the tool in the future. Um, so, what is the situation right now in terms of energy policy planning? Um, unfortunately, although we have seen some improvement in in the ambition levels uh, presented in the National Energy Plan, in the Energy Strategy to 2030, in the National Recovery Plan, uh, there are certain uh, uh, trends that uh, are still there and a bit worrying. Um, they're related to the fact that still uh, um, the decarbonization strategy does not really encompass all economic sectors. So the focus is still mostly on energy, uh, uh, both on the supply side and on the demand side, but there is little inclusion of industry, transportation, and agriculture. And uh, uh, the explanation for measures there is very uh, limited and it's not based on evidence. Uh, 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 it is not based on cost benefit assessments and it's not based on, on uh, the EU trends in general. So there is a need for more integration of the other sectors in the long-term decarbonization planning. Um, one thing that we continuously see, actually don't see in, in Bulgarian energy policy strategies is coal phase out. So coal phase out is a no-go, it seems in policy documents, but it, as all the speakers mentioned uh, uh, earlier, uh, it is finally time to design a very ambitious coal phase out strategy that breaks the pathway dependence. So talking about how the Bulgarian economy cannot survive without coal or the Bulgarian energy system is not sustainable without coal is no longer a valid argument considering all the evidence that shows otherwise. Um, so it is important to move away from, from this coal dependence by investing more into the, uh, the, the vulnerable regions. There are so many sectors, other sectors of the economy there which can uh, uh, absorb many of the uh, uh, job losses, uh, sectors that are, uh, are growing by leaps and bounds and uh, that could benefit from support from the just transition mechanism and from the other uh, 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 EU and national funding. So, so there is a way out, but we, we need to start with defining such a coal phase out strategy. It is still not existing. Um, we need to refrain from uh, having contradictory energy policy objectives in our strategies. Uh, it is important not to combine uh, contradictory kind of investments uh, so that all special interests and all sides are satisfied. So in the NECP and in the other strategies, we see uh, both planning for nuclear investments, natural gas, coal, and renewable energy. Unfortunately, as the energy security dilemma has taught us, it is impossible to have everything. So uh, you need to choose the best mix, the most economically feasible mix and the one that is more realistic at the, at the moment. And trying to, to combine everything together just uh, uh, skews uh, uh, the picture. So in that sense, and this is very much related to the contradictory energy policy objectives, we need to move away from focusing on large scale projects because these absorb huge financial resources and uh, do not step on uh, uh, um, uh, well-founded economic feasibility. So instead, uh, it is important to move to small scale residential and business investments uh, that decentralize energy supply uh, and then uh, prioritize energy communities, prioritize uh, solutions on local level, because there could be solutions also for, for demand uh, reduction, there could be solutions for more uh, renewable energy supply that is sustainable, that is based on local consumption patterns instead of national kind of projections. Um, this is again related to the fact that we need clear indicators and evidence behind policy initiatives. Uh, so more regional uh, decision-making, less centralization of planning. So this is kind of a, a, a big conclusion. Um, and finally, I would say that we need to develop more incentive for changes in individual and collective energy choices. Uh, uh, currently, uh, uh, again, most of energy policy making is top down. So we need to work with citizens, uh, empower citizens, so that they change their lifestyles. Uh, this is the, the cheapest actually way 
to reach decarbonization if people change the way they live. But they need to be incentivized for that. And currently, you don't have much incentive. People rely on subsidized energy. Uh, so as uh, uh, Mr. Stankov mentioned, a key element of, of, of the future uh, transition would be full liberalization of markets uh, so that people start taking uh, economic choices that uh, do not lead to wasteful consumption. I'm not going to go through all this point because we are running out of time, uh, uh, but uh, one, one, one kind of bottom line thing is that in energy policy planning, we need to focus more on energy behavior and we need to integrate policies uh, throughout the whole economy so that we don't take decisions that on a piecemeal uh, 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 approach. So for example, the modernization of the power transmission system envisioned in the National Recovery Plan is an important, a very important uh, uh, point. But it, the way it is described touches only upon the electricity system, the modernization, digitalization of the transmission system operator. It's, uh, uh, it's an important point, but it's a piecemeal approach towards the whole restructuring of the electricity system in general. So there needs to be policies that encompass all aspects uh, of the system because you might uh, see distortions uh, uh, in other uh, areas based on this uh, one, one sided approach. Uh, so integration of horizontal policies and changes of energy behavior. These are probably the, the, the two most important uh, policy takeaways for the future. And I'll, um, thank you. And I would love to see um, many of you in the future to talk more about the tool and how we can use it. Thank you. Maybe that's uh, what the lady means, uh, the existing support scheme from the side of the social ministry. It's a yes. different line of uh, developing and, uh, uh, let's say, from social point of view, helping the, 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 the people which are, which are difficult to hit uh, or, uh, let's say, or cool their houses. Uh, from uh, our point of view, the, the, first of all, uh, as you know, in Europe, there is no... Um, let's say definition of energy poverty, uh, it's expected uh, every country to develop such. And of course, uh, from our point of view, fighting against the, the ener energy poverty on the territory of the countries uh, should be not uh, directly payment to the households, but uh, also measures for energy efficiency, which will decrease their energy consumption and uh, will help them to, let's say, decrease their payments and uh, for, for electricity, gas, or all energy components. Uh, from this point of view, the answer is uh, again included in the recovery and resilience plan, where we uh, plan uh, to invest a huge amount of money, more than 25% of the, of the whole amount of the, of the recovery resilience fund directly for energy efficiency, uh, but not only into the households, only uh, also for uh, public buildings and uh, uh, for uh, enterprises. Uh, we're gonna fight against uh, energy poverty in the future with uh, energy efficiency measures directly into the buildings. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, you're right that uh, connecting fuel facilities at the moment, Bulgaria applies more or less for uh, infrastructure related with the new lines with the neighbor countries, uh, electricity lines or uh, gas interconnectors. Uh, more or less, uh, we see in the future the uh, gas infrastructure as an opportunity for transporting uh, green gases, uh, uh, also green hydrogen. Uh, which uh, means that uh, even at the moment we uh, are thinking with the construction of new lines of the opportunity in the future injection or let's say or dividing the, the different lines for, for green hydrogen or green gases. 
um, related with your questions, uh, is Bulgaria ready to support uh, inclusion for uh, geothermal heating cooling into the connecting fuel facility from our point of view on the Bulgarian territory and the information uh, we together collected with the Ministry of Environment in Bulgaria territory is potential for geothermal energy. Uh, even at the moment in the Ministry of Energy, we're starting a special call from the uh, one supporting scheme, Norwegian, Norwegian program. But the huge problem on our territory is that this uh, uh, geothermal potential is not near to the consumption, which means that it will uh, come to extra cost in the, in, in the big, let's say, in the regions where, where the consumption is situated at the moment. But uh, why not? I mean, we have to assess it with other colleagues and to, to see how far this is, uh, this is a good solution of the future problems related with heating and cooling. But renewables into the heating and cooling uh, for us is very important. Even at the moment, uh, Bulgaria is, uh, sub, let, let's say, uh, supporting the, the, the companies with uh, uh, co-generation uh, additional payments uh, with the opportunity to generate more uh, more incomes and invest into the new technologies in the future. Okay, thank you very much for the question. Um, yes, you have observed correctly that in the values, which of course they're summarizing everything across Europe for all different countries. So of course there is a small change, but the overall potential to increase hydropower across Europe is very limited because we are using already a lot of potential. There is a bit of potential and it is especially used for storing and then reproducing electricity. So for balancing it, but you cannot build so many more new dams across Europe simply because they have been used already. And there's also other environmental matters in Norway where people think of building so many dams, but not everyone wants this. Um, so hydropower is not going to be the game changer that is saving everything, um, but it is helpful, um, but it's also not that cheap to construct a new hydropower dam, um, but it is helpful for storage aspects. But it, it, it is one of the aspects, but we see a much higher potential for wind onshore, for photovoltaic because they become the cheapest option and then in some areas wind offshore but wind offshore is also more expensive and of course not all countries in Europe have offshore sites. Um, Thank you. We uh, were exact with zero additional uh, huge uh, generation of uh, hydro. Uh, as Mr. Paul uh, mentioned, uh, we think that uh, also in the Bulgarian territory uh, huge potential is utilized. At the moment, of course, here we are not including uh, uh, the future opportunities of extension of the pump accumulation hydro storage in Chaira. And uh, uh, in the plan, I think there were 2,600 uh, megawatt, uh, about 2,600 megawatt new installed capacity by renewables, about 2,200 uh, was. Uh, 2,100 photovoltaics, about uh, uh, 250, about between 250 and 300 uh, wind, and uh, 222 uh, bio, uh, coming from biomass. So unfortunately, we're reaching uh, towards the end of the, our online webinar. I would like to thank, uh, first to thank to all the panelists for their um, extremely interesting and uh, thought provocative contributions. Uh, then also to the audience for their active participation, all the questions. And now I would like to give the floor to my colleague Todor uh, Galev uh, for some concluding remarks. Okay, thank you very much, Radustina. Um, I would like just to outline two things that uh, um, many of our speakers actually today already uh, highlighted. Uh, first of all, that we need um, integrated strategy, strategic framework, which is uh, horizontal for all the sectors and uh, um, which is, uh, and this is the second important thing, it's uh, complement, uh, it, it has a high uh, degree of um, complementarity. So all the sectoral policies 
politic, uh, policies should uh, complement each other uh, in um, uh, our efforts to reach the Green Deal uh, goals. And um, the second thing that uh, all of us also, um, all of the panelists or many of them uh, mentioned is the need for change in the uh, people's uh, behavior uh, in their um, uh, everyday lifestyle. And I think that this is the point where actually uh, Bulgaria institutions, but also uh, organizations from the civil society uh, are, um, um, could be uh, 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 very useful in, in, uh, and um, uh, helpful in next uh, years to come, because this is the point where uh, I think the um, uh, Bulgarian society left behind the other developing uh, developed countries uh, in uh, in, the, in the European Union. So uh, the lack of proper information and uh, um, uh, and uh, uh, public discussion on all this very important issue uh, is something that we have to leapfrog in, in very fast in next few years if we want to change really the uh, people's mindset. Uh, saying this, I would like to thank uh, once more to all of our um, panelists today, also to all of the attendees uh, and to the other participants for their uh, active participation and for listening to us. And uh, uh, it will be great to see you again in, in next uh, events when uh, organized by all of us. Thank you very much once and be safe uh, in these very hard times. Thank you. <laughs>